This is Ethan and I'm here with Dave, and together we are Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast, episode 164-inch. On this episode, we finish our interview with three-time world champion accordion player and Guinness world record holder, Corey Pesatoro. It's Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast. It's a podcast about Weird Al. It's Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast. Seriously, the whole podcast is about Weird Al. You don't have to listen, but we're glad you are. Well, hello, A. Eh? Hello, A, eh, to you too, A. Eh? You do know why we're saying A eh, today, A. Eh? Of course, A. Eh? We're celebrating the fact that Weird A L just did a run of shows in Canada, A. Eh? That's a great guess, A. Eh? But really, we are behind on our quota, A, eh? according to the Canadian Broadcasting and Podcasting Association, A. Eh? The guidelines in section A eh, outline that we need to say A eh, more often, A. Eh? A, hey, why don't you say so? We can say a, a, a ton of times to catch up, A. Eh? We just need two more and we're caught up. You know what I'm saying? I know what you're saying. This reminded me because we get the question a lot, and I'm starting to wonder it myself. Why exactly do we need to follow the Canadian Broadcasting and Podcasting Association standards and practices? I mean, we're not Canadian. The majority of our listeners are not in Canada. Weird Al isn't Canadian. Our intern Frank is not even allowed in Canada. I mean, I could just keep going. Well, no need. I'll tell you exactly why, eh? Nah, don't bother. That's all we needed. <laughs> Hoorah! Well, with all that ridiculousness out of the way, it's time for what's happening in Weird Al related news. Weird Al is still out on the road for his The Unfortunate Return of the Ridiculously Self Indulgent Ill Advised Vanity Tour. And according to our friend and supporter Jared Marker, at Monday's show in Duluth, Minnesota, Weird Al told the audience that Ruben Valtiera had tested positive for COVID 19 four days prior. Jared said the show was played without any keyboards and that some songs sounded a bit different. Jared also reported that Weird Al made a remark that everyone in the band just had to rock 25% harder, which doesn't sound like too much of a challenge for Weird Al and the guys. Well, we're really sad to hear this news and we're hoping for a fast recovery. So from all of us here at Dave and Ethan's 2000 Inch Weird Al podcast, get well soon, Ruben. This episode is brought to you in part by vegan burrito restaurant Burrito Burrito in Troy, New York, home of the two pound double wrapped in a quesadilla burrito burrito and Wizard Burger in Albany, New York. Come on down to Burrito Burrito and Burrito Burrito, your Burrito Burrito, or hop on over to Wizard Burger for mouth-watering, loaded, dare I say beefy, vegan burgers. From Troy to Albany to Uranus, Burrito Burrito and Wizard Burger, feed the hungry with out-of-this-world, plant-based, real food, always vegan style. Visit burritosquared.com and wizardburger.com to order ahead. Now, our friend and past guest, Metal L just announced that he has a brand new album coming out this month. Into the Abyss. The album is called Into the Abyss and available now for pre-order on metalal.bandcamp.com. And that's not all. Metal L also shared the first single off of his new album, Into the Abyss. Dave, it sounds like you might need some burrito burrito. You, you sound pretty hungry over there. Oh, I know what that is. That's Metal Al. He's right here with us in the studio. Oh, yeah. I forgot Metal Al is standing right there on mic. Hey, guys. Well, now that you're here, I guess we can just ask you instead of talking about it ourselves. Tell us, you've got a brand new album coming out. When, when is it out? What is it called? Yeah, I got a brand new album coming out. It's called Into the Abyss. It's uh, coming out on July 27th. So that's when the official album, the full album, will be released on uh, 7 27 22. So, you know, I had to do the 27th. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> Starting today, though, if you go over to my Bandcamp page, you can pre order the album and hear the new single right away. And uh, the pre orders will be open until uh, July 31st. So uh, you'll just ha you have the rest of the month to pre order the album. Uh, we're doing CDs, vinyls, uh, digital release. Oh, that's really cool. So what can you tell us about the uh, first single off of the album? 
Uh, so the first single off the album is really what started the album. It, it all started back when we all got together to see the Nightmare Before Christmas Halloween show. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. So so David Grant and Summer Woods were both at that show with me. And we all got to talking at like how cool it would be if all of us got together to do a song together. But, you know, we were just like, yeah, that would be cool. And then, you know, months, a couple months go by. And uh, David Grant brought it up again, like, oh, man, it'd be really cool. And the song I was thinking was I Was Only Kidding. And I was just like, yeah, that would be a cool one. I think that one could really work. But, you know, you know, it was all just talk. And then finally I, like, sat down and was like, all right, if, if we're going to make this happen, I'm going to make it happen. <laughs> so um, I just sat down and started figuring out the song. And uh, so I got David Grant, Summer Woods involved. And then I also got Jake Larson involved and Zeb Lemke involved. Whoa. It's this Weird Al super fan track, yeah. Yeah, it's like a super fan tribute track cover. Absolutely, it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, and so I have gotten to listen to it, and everyone can go listen to it now once they pre-order the album. And it's pretty stinking majestic, Metal Al. Thank you. It was a lot of work. I'm so happy that it came together and that it sounds as good as that it, it does sound. But yeah, so yeah, I got, I got Jake Larson playing bass. I got Zeb playing all those crazy guitar solos throughout. I got MC Chalkskin dropping some dope bars. <laughs> nice. And then, of course, we got Summer Woods to grace the track. She kills it at the beginning. Because it's like, how would Summer Woods fit into a Metal Al album? And you did it perfectly in the best way possible. Right. Thank you. Yeah. I, that, that, that was, that was uh, the, the way that I was like, okay, here's how we can get her to work. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd love to hear a little bit of I Was Only Kidding off of the brand new Metal Al album, Into the Abyss. Let's take a listen right now. When I said that I'd be faithful When I promised I'd be true When I swore that I could never be with anyone but you when I told you that I loved you with those tender words I spoke I was only kidding now can't you take a joke Oh, so good. I love that. <laughs> it's <is> awesome. <laughs> Metal L. This is actually kind of a different album than you've done in the past. Can you tell us about that? You know, I always want to do something new, something different than I did last time. So this time I, I, I looked at the songs that I hadn't done yet. I knew that we already. I was already doing I Was Only Kidding because I had already started that one. So as I was kind of preparing for the album... I looked at what songs were available and I decided to do a concept album and take certain songs to, to form a story when told in an order. So uh, I decided to tell the love story between the Waffle King and Airline Amy. <laughs> <laughs> so awesome. It's a fantastic album. Everyone needs to pre-order right now. MetalAl.Bandcamp.com. Get the vinyl. Get the CD. Officially will drop on the 27th of July. And right now you can get I Was Only Kidding. Well, Metal Al, thank you so much for joining us. And this has just been awesome. Oh, thanks for having me, guys. Thanks. Uh, rock on. Uh. <laughs> well, once again, a huge thank you to Metal Al. We cannot wait for the full album, Into the Abyss, to get released on July 27th. And head on over and secure your copies of Into the Abyss over at metalal.bandcamp.com. And also be sure to visit patreon.com slash 2000 inch as our intern Frank has recently posted several new bonus episodes 
for our Patreon family. As you might be aware, for every single concert that either Ethan and myself have attended so far on Weird Al's The Unfortunate Return of the Ridiculously Self-Indulgent Ill-Advised Vanity Tour, we have recorded our concert review and we are sharing them with you. Now to date, we have recorded 24 of these episodes and our Patreon family can listen to all of them right now. While our more frugal listeners, I mean, you know, the cheap sales, I mean, the general public, they can listen up through episode 18 centimeter for free right now via our normal podcast channels. And as a reminder, I'll be back out on the road this coming weekend for both shows in Chicago. And then I will join you the following weekend and we both will hit the two shows in Minnesota together. So we intend to record our ridiculously self-indulgent bonus episodes for each of those shows and all the other ones we're going to, so stay tuned. And if you will be at any of those shows, please stop by and say hello. We'd love to meet you. And if you want to be the first to hear our concert reviews, be sure to join the coolest group of cool people over at patreon.com slash 2000 inch. And remember, our Patreon family gets to hear each and every bonus episode early. Now, last episode, Corey Pesitoro was just about to tell us about getting his Guinness World Record when we had to stop. So let's jump right back into that interview for the final half, right where we left off. I definitely want to hear about how you got involved with breaking the Guinness World Record for the longest continuing playing. Can you tell us about how that happened? Uh, well, that gets into more of my racing stuff, <laughs> which, is, which is good. Oh, okay. So when I had, you know, when I had retired for the fourth time, uh, from after the Acoustic World Championship. It had been just a couple of years, and I said, well, goodness, I need another accolade. It's been a little while. <laughs> and I, what happened was I was going to <laughs> see Jeopardy. Of all things, I'm going to see Jeopardy in L.A., and I, I'm in line and blah, 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 and, and, this, and this, this nice couple and their daughter in front of me, and we start talking, and, and oh, you're a musician. Oh, she's a, she plays harp. Oh, cool. And, and she has the Guinness World Record for the longest harp performance. Oh, wow. I went, oh. oh, oh, that's interesting. And so, you know, his name was, I think, Carly Styra or something like that. And so I'm, so now while we're talking and going into Jeopardy, I'm looking, I'm doing my own Jeopardy question thing. I'm going into Guinness World Record. I'm looking up all the instruments, piano, drums, and all, and harp, all that. And I come across accordion, and it was 31 hours and, uh, I don't know, 30 minutes, somewhere mm -hmm. around there. And I said, Oh, hell, I can do that. <laughs> so I call up uh, my friends at Red Bull because I've done music a lot for the Red Bull Formula One team. And uh, at the time, one of my dear friends was the head of the Red Bull Ring, which was the, the Oosterdijk track, uh, which Formula One races on every year. And Red Bull uh, owns, actually, in Austria, because Red Bull is an Austrian company. A lot of people don't realize that. It's an Austrian company. And um, I called him up, and I was like, I got a crazy idea. You know, we were planning and doing a concert in August in Austria. How about I try to break the Guinness World Record and we parlay that with, I'm going to have to drink Red Bull to break the record. Brilliant. <laughs> and he Brilliant. loved it. He's like, that's a great idea. Oh, my goodness. So so they sponsored it. Red Bull paid. Every, they flew me to Austria. They put the signs up. They hired a whole team. Because you would not believe the logistics it takes to set a Guinness World Record. It, the logistical aspects before, during, and after are way worse than the actual record. Hmm. There's huh. so much involved in, in getting it all done. So I'm sure there are many other records, many other records around the world that really exist that the people just didn't go through with all the stuff to do the Guinness right. record. Um, and they're almost impossible to get a hold of. Like, it's, I think they have three people working at Guinness or something. It's, it's just insane. <laughs> so they, they paid for everything. They got it all to happen. And I, I was planning, like, okay, what preparation should I do? Like, should I do some gym work here? And should I do maybe a 16-hour, you know, kind of test run to see how I feel after 16 hours? I said, no, that'll, I'll wear myself out. I could injure myself. Screw it. I went into my competition mode. No, I'm going to do zero preparation in anything with what I eat, what I drink, you know, with, with something I should take while I'm there, exercises. I'm doing nothing. I'm going there, and I'm going to break the dang record. Uh, it, it's all mental. Most things in, in life to me, I think, are mental. And that's what happened. And I actually got the worst sleep ever because I made the crucial error that I never make, and I made it on that trip, where when I got to Europe, you know, you haven't slept all night. You took the overnight flight. Yep. You're supposed to go there, mm -hmm. stay crazy tired, and then go to sleep at a normal time, 10, 11 p.m. So then when you wake up the next day, 
because you're going to sleep so long because you're so tired. Then you're done their time. Well, I made the mistake of when I got to the hotel, I said, let me just take a two-hour nap. And I guess I didn't hear my alarm, and I slept for like six hours. Oh, oh So no. now it's 10 p.m. I'm not tired. I can't get to sleep till 5 in the morning the next day, and I have one more day to, to like in the mid. I was all screwed up. Oh, no. So we started at 10 in the morning. The, the head of the Red Bull Formula One team, Helmut Marco, who Formula One fans listening will know, he came down, and we had breakfast, and we did the intro thing and, and all that, and, and we did it at an eyeglass store. So it, the business was open during both days, and people were coming in buying glasses going, who the F is this accordion player playing in the window with all these signs around him? <laughs> <laughs> probably, yeah. and, and it's right in Graz, Austria, this beautiful little Austrian town. I highly recommend going to it. About an hour away from the, the racetrack. And um, yeah, we had, they had a, a policeman the whole time. They hired three people because uh, it's it supposed to be every four hours. So they did three people every two and a half hours. Or You only needed two vi uh, people to watch. They have to write down every single song that you play, when you start it, when you end it. Again, the logistics are crazy. Wow. Uh, the policeman was there for overnight. Also, they had a speaker outside. That kept me trying to play good because the speaker outside, people could hear me play. So instead, when you start playing terrible after 16, 20, 24 hours, like I had to keep trying to play well because people are listening to me. You know, the 36 hour, 30 second hour, people must be like, oh my God, this guy's terrible because your hands are like freezing up. Um, and... And I did nothing. Everyone's like, oh, you should have had uh, mercury or I forget what they, oh, this drug and that drug and melatonin. I don't know. I did nothing. I just drank water, drank some orange juice, maybe some coffee, had some Red Bull and uh, ate pretzels. I love pretzels. Even they had a, an Austrian interviewer from like the local NBC or ABC affiliate, whatever the same is out there, ITV, come in and interview me while I'm playing and gave me a pretzel. And I'm like, how am I supposed to hold that? I can't stop playing because I'm worried if I screw up the timing, the whole thing is gone. So, um, so, so yeah, we did it. And then, uh, we sprayed champagne outside on the window and, and, uh, and yeah, I did it. I remember though, after saying, never do, I took a mental note, never do this again. You're going to say later, it wasn't that hard and it wasn't that hard, but just don't ever do this again. <laughs> so I remember that mental note. <laughs> <laughs> so your your record is 32 hours and 14 minutes. Are you allowed to go to the bathroom and take like a small break or how does that actually work? Yes. So the thing is every 60, you get five, not every 55, you get five, but every 60, you get five and you can compound that and do 120 and then do 10. But I, I thought from day one, I was like, that's a terrible idea. Take the dang break every time you can. And the okay. thing is five minutes is great in the first 12 hours. But later on, it takes a minute and a half to get the accordion off and a minute and a half to get the accordion on because you hurt so much. So you really only get like a two-minute break to go to the bathroom or stretch or go run around and go, ah. <laughs> so it's, it's really tough. And I just think, my God, these poor souls. Imagine the, you know, Graz Austria Tribune every day, you know, advertising for, we need people from the 2 to 5 a.m. slot. We need people from the 5 to 8 a.m. slot to listen to this accordion player play music. Like, can you imagine the crazy people that took that volunteering job? But <laughs> they did they got enough people to do it so so are, are you like talking while you're playing are you singing how does that work or did would you change it up oh i was i was definitely talking i was i was definitely talking and you know some of the witnesses they had were some very beautiful austrian girls so i was most certainly talking yeah. <laughs> uh while i was playing uh, but, but you can't i mean it'd be boring to just sit there and play anyway but just to keep conversation going uh you know obviously it's going to keep your mind going. And and the thing is, everyone's like, oh, I hope you sat down a lot. But what's interesting when you do a record like that, it doesn't matter if certain positions or standing are harder on your body or not, because actually what matters the most is not being in the same position. So there was some full hours that I stood up, even 23, four or five hours into it, because standing up did not put pressure on whatever muscles and parts of my body I was putting pressure on to oh sit. Oh, goodness. Mm. So that's the shocking thing. So actually standing up feels good because you're maybe putting pressure and pain on your lower legs and feet, but you haven't done that the past six hours sitting down. So it, it was interesting. You just had to not be in the same position for a long time and just keep using different parts of your body uh, to, to play. Incredible. That's incredible. <laughs>
I, I can't even imagine what you went through. And, and how do you know when you're done? Is it just you collapse on the ground at 32 hours and 14 minutes? No, no. We we planned it. that We, we started at 10 a.m. to have the thing you know, end at 6 p.m. the next day. And so people would be there that have the press there. So we kind of planned when I would stop, even if I could go longer. And the thing is, I didn't want to go much longer because... Most you have to remember, most people that do Guinness World Records, it's not what they do for their career. They just set out to break the record. I'm in a position where this was my career and I had a huge concert in LA a week later. I couldn't injure myself. And not to mention I was coming okay. back to Austria to do a concert a couple of weeks later. Mm. So, you know, I can't injure myself. So forty five minutes past the record, that's enough. You know, okay, we broke the record. That's good enough. I don't want to injure myself. So, uh, and my, the little, I had a little bit of pain for six months after it in the tips of my fingers, but this is, it went away. So I, I didn't have any long-term, uh, effects oh. on it, but, uh, yeah, we had pre-planned when I would end it as long as I could. But to me, I was like, Red Bull spending all this money to fly me. I'm not failing. And I just think that's the case most right. of the times. <laughs> it's not about the preparation you put into it. It's do you want to do it or do you not? Right. And I said, I'm, mm. there's no way I'm failing. And what's funny is I went back to my hotel and put my arms in cold water for 10 minutes. And I said, man, all the guys that were associated with this event are having a fun time back in the middle of the town, you know, partying it up that, that we all did it. Right. I can't be here. And I got up, I changed, got dressed, went back on the train, went back to the place, walked over and they're like, what? He's back. He's back. <laughs> I was like, I was like. I'm not missing out on the party part of this. Are you crazy? And then I did like a Facebook Live, you know, uh, oh, telling wow. everybody that we had done it. But the thing is, the press and media couldn't say Corey broke the record because a fish. Actually, it was a good way to see which newspapers and media was truly professional, which weren't. The ones that said, you know, Pesaturo breaks world record were wrong. It should, the one like the Boston Globe did, has, has attempted. Because until Guinness approves it, you can't say you broke it. They have okay. to have seal okay. approval, send you the paper. So, hmm. um, which it was, but it took, it took a couple months. And then you don't go in till the next year's book, which then doesn't come out for another year. So it was like a year and three months before I got a book with me in the book. Um, wow. You know, it takes a long time for that to actually go through. But, oh, um, wow. but yeah, we did approve it. And all the, the lists that the witnesses had written had to go in the book. Again, the, the timings of when I started and stopped tunes had to be all in there. Uh, there's so many logistics involved wow. with doing one of those things. <laughs> and I'm going for another one in a couple of weeks at Indianapolis. So that has to do with Mario Andretti and me playing in the back of the two-seater and Mario Andretti, uh, most famous racing driver in American history, will be driving at Indianapolis, the most famous racetrack, with Delara on uh, watching. And Delara is the most famous chassis builder of all time. So we're going to have a, a fun time trying to do some kind of record where I play the accordion in the back of the two-seater while he's doing somewhere between 190 and 220 miles an hour throughout the track. Wow. <laughs> I love that. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah. Got to combine my careers and my hobbies. Yeah, so you told us that you were a, a big sports fan, and then you had mentioned that you did hang out with Mario Andretti, and then uh, you did let us in on a little secret about uh, something that's on your accordion. I'd like you to share that with everybody else. <laughs> yes, the, the only signature I, I have on the accordion is Mario. So, um, you know, it's, it's very, very cool, and he's such a nice guy, uh, especially because the fact, I mean, his life story is, if you're looking for a great American story, his is it where he, you know, him and his family had a good amount of money when he was a baby, and the communist government in World War II came in, it's now Croatia, they came in, grabbed his family's land and said, uh, here's a, a check for your land. It was like one one hundredth the value of the land. And they became refugees. And until he was 15 years old, lived in like this one big room with eight other families, and the only thing separating them was, was a, basically a carpet and no privacy. And finally, they got a visa to come to America. And he comes to America at, what, 16 years old, barely ever touching a car, let alone driving one. And then Nazareth Speedway, where he still lives in Nazareth, they went to Nazareth. And he said, I want to be a race car driver. And they just faked their way into making everyone believe they were race car drivers, even though they had never even driven a car. <laughs> and sure wow. enough, he starts winning everything. And then he gets into IndyCar. And then he wins the Daytona 500. And then he wins the Indy 500. And, wow. and, and the rest is history. Um, but because he came from such absurdly humble beginnings, 
Um, you know, he's just such a down to earth guy. He's the most common and down to earth superstar you'll ever meet, along with Weird Al when you meet him. He's so down to earth. So um, <laughs> it's amazing to know the guy is a living, walking <laughs> legend, uh, as, as is Weird Al, in totally different worlds and totally different aspects, but the, the, they, they both are. Yeah. Now, in your impromptu concert for us and the other Weird Al fans, you actually played, I believe, Smells Like Nirvana, although I guess it could have been Smells Like Teen Spirit. Yeah, I was going to say, that's the title. <laughs> <laughs> Are there other Weird Al-related tunes that you play on the on the accordion? Oh, I'm trying to... I probably do. I got to think of... Well, I'm sure I play... Uh, I'm, I'm fat. I probably play... Um, oh, God. What's some other famous ones? I mean, Happy, Tacky. Mm -hmm. or aluminum yeah. foil i'm sure i play i play those <laughs> um the one i'd love to learn is that one that he ends with where they do all the different languages that whole oh, end thing yeah. i asked steve asked her, i said steve i only have one question for you i don't care about all the bass notes you play how the bleep do you remember all that crap at the end <laughs> and he said only because we've been doing it for decades Oh, Otherwise, wow. I'd have no idea what the heck I'm doing. <laughs> and I said, we've been adding on, adding on, adding on to that. So I remember the earlier parts with no problem. But I said, <laughs> how I was astonished at how they could do all of that. that yeah, the Yoda incredible. chant is an absolute marvel of, of musical talent from all those guys. Engineering. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I saw this clip of you on Jimmy Fallon's game show, That's My Jam, performing for Kate Hudson. I mean, you got to tell us about that. That is the coolest thing ever. Well, I, I mean, in classic Corey form, I had no idea who Kate Hudson was until, like, <laughs> after. Like, like, oh, my God, she's so famous. She's, like, so famous. I'm like, oh, okay, all right. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I don't know. I know sports people. I'm not. I don't know the movie and streaming and the TV. I, I don't uh, news maybe or something. <laughs> but um, yeah, that that one was really funny because it's another case of people don't know what they want, and the producers and I were almost, you know, always arguing lightly about what to play. And you know, when they, I gave them a whole bunch of tunes that would sound cool on the accordion. And they're like, yeah, but we really want to do this rap tune. And I'm like, okay, rap is the one genre where they take three seconds and they repeat right, it. Right. So since I'm not rapping, if I play a rap tune and they say they don't know and say keep playing, it's just going to be the same thing. And I could improvise, except you wouldn't want me to improvise because then I'm not playing right. the song. So it's a no-win situation. Just let's choose stuff that has different parts, which the, um, the second tune that I played, uh, Born to be Wild, that has five different parts to it. So that works great. But the rap tune, the, the you know, Biggie Smalls, I, I, it's just the same. It's, and it's the tune between the sheets. I actually did a YouTube video where I go over how I came up with those. But it's it's the same lick kind of over and over and over. But they wanted that tune. But then they wanted they wanted to do accordion sounds. And I'm like, well, you got the wrong guy here. I'm the guy trying to make the accordion cool again. I'm not, I, I don't want to play accordion sounds because their whole thing was we need weird instruments to come out and play popular music. I said, which technically is offensive, not that, you know, I don't even believe in getting offended, but it's like, that's what you're basically saying. We want weird instruments to play this. Well, my job is to make the weird instrument actually cool. So I'm not going to play accordion sounds on this. So we came to an agreement that I, the left hand, I would play electronic stuff and the right hand, I'd play accordion. But then, as you notice, when you see the actual video, when I go out, I immediately play an electric sound to freak them all out, and that worked great. I thought the producers weren't going to keep it. I thought they were going to be pissed I did that. They kept it. They must have liked it. <laughs> they all go, oh, my God, that's not an accordion. That doesn't sound like an accordion. Kate Hudson's brother. That doesn't sound like an accordion. So, so then, when I play the two tunes, I had accordion in the right hand, but you couldn't really hear it. I'm, I did electronic sounds on both sides because, as is the case most of the time, even though I talked to the producers 150 times, at the end of the day, they don't know what they don't know this aspect of music, and they didn't. They all loved what I did, and I felt like saying I didn't do it all what you told me to do 150 times. I did right. what I wanted to do, right. and you thought it was great. So <laughs> you know, it's just it's just another case. If you know what you're doing and you know what you're talking about, and you really do, go 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 and do it. So um, I think it went good. I, I hope that it had brought some light to the accordion that people are like, oh, I didn't know the accordion. I didn't know it could do that. Um, Mm. And it can, because everything I'm doing is still playing accordion. Yeah, I have all the sounds on it. But the mainframe of what I'm playing and use of the bellows and use of the technique, it's, it's all the same as if I was playing 
Bach at a, at a classical competition. It's all this, it's the same. I'm still playing accordion. It's just the sounds are different. Yeah. So Corey, I understand that you got to perform for President Bill Clinton when you were a young child. Can you tell us at the White House, can you tell us how that happened? Well, I mean, as a kid, I don't think I realized the moment. I mean, I did. Uh, just because uh, I was always interested in history and things like that. So I realized, but certainly not uh, to the level I, uh, that I should, you know, when you're older, like, oh my God. Um, but Bill just, uh, what, what happened was my uncle sent in a tape. I had won the national championship in my age group at 11. And my uncle sent in a VHS. Remember those the VHS tapes? Remember those? <laughs> so he sent in one of those. And they uh, they loved it. And they brought me in and because the, the White House always does these amateurs uh, playing at the White House uh, for Christmas time. And that's never stopped. Uh, you know, even even Trump had it. Every, everybody's always had this and they have amateurs come in and play. Hmm. And so we went down and my dad being the very old fashioned Italian he is, kept just bugging the crap out of our secretary we had with us to get me to play where the dignitaries were going in to see Bill. Because there's many different locations in the first floor of the White House where they had people go in. And he was talking kind of near where the China Room is. And there was a musician playing by there. So he got them to have me play there. And finally, on a break, when Bill Clinton took a little break from meeting people, I remember Wolf Blitzer walked by me. And I didn't know who it was, but then later I was like, oh my God, that was Wolf Blitzer, the guy with the white hair. <laughs> so he, uh, and he had white hair. He had white hair back then. He's always had white hair. I don't know what's going on with the guy. He's aging backwards. So, um, so when Bill took a break, he, he must have told, you know, the, his photographer and the people that were in the room, Secret Service, go get that accordion book. Because Bill is a huge music fan. He loves music. In fact, what, what helped right. his campaign in 1992 more than anything is when he went on the Arsenio Hall show when he played saxophone. And I mean, my right. mom's a perfect example. She didn't know who she was going to vote for. And then when she saw that, she's like, I'm voting for that guy. <laughs> so he's a, he's a big music right. guy. And he said, go and get that accordion player. So they brought me in. And I, I can still, I remember the moment the guy was like, uh, the president would like to have you come in and play. And I wasn't, I wasn't that nervous because I was already like, okay, all right, all right, I'll get this. Right. So I, I remember I went in, I played a tune for him and and he's there with his crystal glass, but it's got Diet Coke in it. He's always drinking Diet Coke. Okay. And actually it's in the picture. You see the Diet Coke in the glass. And, and they had my parents <laughs> actually, who, who was there, they had my parents come to the, the, the door so they could actually see the in the room and watch this moment, which was really cool for them. I didn't even see that they were there. And, um, and he, and he kind of gave this very motivational speech about, uh, you know, if you want to become the best, you have to be like Michael Jordan, because this is like 1998, 99. Yeah. You got to be like Jordan. You got to be the first person to practice, and you got to be the last person to leave. Yeah. You know, and uh, so he was—he was just very much like a teacher at that moment of how to become the best. And and I think that it had an absolute effect on me. The fact that I then won the national championship and then won all these world championships and set all kinds of records. You know, that was him telling me that at, at eleven. Uh, you know, you got to be like Michael Jordan. So, <laughs> and um, and then they had me come back for uh, the state dinner of the president of Hungary, which is hilarious to think of now in the social media age. They would have ripped him for this. They're like, yeah, we're having the president of Hungary come in, so we want you to come in and play a couple of polkas. <laughs> now, polka and Hungary really don't have anything in common, but we didn't have the internet in those days, right, so even right. the government didn't know what they were talking about. Yeah. It's okay. But, um, yeah, imagine social media today. This terrible president, who, what an idiot, who could he think polka? But, you know, it was just fine. So I went in and played, like, clarinet polka and roll out the barrel, actually, for the president of Hungary in the East Room at the state dinner. Martha Stewart was there. Wow. Tony Curtis was there. All kinds wow. of people were there. Wow. And, and then Bill, and we have the video, Bill comes and grabs me and brings me to the head table and tells the whole room about who I am. And I'm standing next to Hillary and Hillary's talking to me while, while he's introducing me and, you know, I got to meet everybody. It was just, it was just an amazing, Incredible. you know, moment. And I can still remember that moment. It's still like, wow, that actually happened. Yeah, yeah. And, and, I'm and then we stayed the whole night and they have a dance later and my parents are dancing and there's Bill and Hillary dancing. I mean, it's just, it's just uh, crazy. And then my dad, that was actually one, another side story. My dad being the old Italian, again, that he is, um, he slapped the president. And how he did this was because this was the, the, uh, this was right after he got impeached 
with Monica. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's amazing that the guy gets impeached for that when we don't need to even go into how many girls JFK was with. My God, he almost got into World War Three with us just because of the amount of Russian girls he was getting with. <laughs> but, you know, Bill does his one, you know, incident there and gets impeached. And my dad goes up to him and he slap now in Italian, he must have known this, because in Italian culture, you slap on the cheek as it's like a sign of affection. And he slaps him on the cheek and sa cheek and says, you know, Bill, you're a hard <laughs> You're a hard <laughs> Like, good for you for, you know, getting some side action in, you know, in the White House, I guess. And, you know, <laughs> and, and Bill's just laughing and smiling. If you tried to slap the president today, you'd be shot by this secret. Right. Service. I'm surprised <laughs> you know, but, your dad but, wasn't tackled. <laughs> no, no. But you got to remember, Bill... Is is in the same story of like a Mario Andretti. I mean, Bill grew up incredibly poor with a broken family, and you know he came from nothing. So, you know, he, in my as as did my dad. You know, so it was kind of it was a really interesting, funny, very Italian mafia connection. He just slaps him. <laughs> and he says, "You're right." So, um, <laughs> but uh, but it was funny because it was a guy moment because he's talking about you know what, <laughs> right? You know? Right. It's, he's not talking about global policy or, oh, or geopolitics. Or, so. Um, <laughs> But yeah, and then and then they had me come back uh, many times after, and you know, seeing them since. So obviously, you can imagine what a devastating night 2016 was because I was about to know the president, and then, uh, well, that didn't go so well. Right. But you know, I'm a sports guy, so I accept when my teams lose. You got to go to the next season. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, what an incredible career and and life story you've had just so far, and you're still so young. Um, it's incredible to hear about all this. Uh, I really encourage our listeners to check out your website, cpezmusic.com, and follow you on Instagram and Facebook, cpez, that's C, the letter C, P-E-Z, and you've got a couple albums out. You've got one called Unscription. Think of the Pez Dispenser. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you need to sell Pez dispensers with your face on it. I have been I, I've been trying to like get a contact at Pez because I would go crazy to have a C Pez Pez. That'd be I amazing. Want a C Pez Pez. <laughs> be amazing. <laughs> yeah. With the accordion like below where the mouth is. You know? I'm wondering, do they have accordion Pez? They gotta have an accordion Pez somewhere. I right? don't I don't think so. Yeah, I could do that oh. and then I'll tell them to do a weird owl one, but I want to do mine first. Yeah. You know? Okay. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> So, Corey, we can get your album Unscripted, which you did with Mari Black, and also you're on an album called The Outrospectives. Both are available as hard CDs uh, or digital on cpezmusic.com. Yes, that is true. That is true. Well, Corey, I have to ask you this question. This is a Weird Al podcast. If you were to do any sort of collaboration with Weird Al, what song or songs would you want to perform? Are we saying a song he hasn't done yet? Uh... Either way, I mean, let's say it's your choice. Let's say Weird Al approaches you and says, Corey, I want to do something with you. Your choice. What would you perform with Weird Al? Oh, man, that is that is a good question. Oh, man. Because, um, I mean, if, for ones that he's done, I would probably do Smells Like Teen Spirit just because I could solo like crazy with the electric guitar patch, and it would be <laughs> hilarious. Uh, and I also love the way <laughs> how he made fun of, you know, the fact that that genre you can't hear what they're saying and i don't know what i'm saying you know <laughs> other part where he's like <laughs> yeah. nah, 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 nah. it's like yeah that's all i hear too well i can't hear anything else <laughs> um but that yeah that's a good question darn it what would be a good one or would you want to just jam with him oh no i mean i would love i'd love to jam with him i definitely love to jam with him that's for that's for sure yeah um, but maybe maybe actually do a Jacob Collier uh, tune. You know, me being a jazz guy, of course, we all are crazy for Jacob. So I don't know, <laughs> do, do something like that and, and wear the bear hats uh, and such. <laughs> but no, I would I would just oh my god, that would be amazing to do to do something with him. And you know, I, I think uh, between the stuff that I play and, and Weird Al, what he does, my goodness, like we we could change the accordion instantly. You know, he's he's kept it going all these years it's like I, I think we could together merge the powers and and make the accordion something <laughs> that kids want to play and the thing is about it even though i've noticed this very much with all the schools that i play even though we live in a world where the younger generations are obsessed with getting something that's instant gratification completely instant 
At the same time, if you get mm -hmm. kids before their brains have been ruined by the internet and cell phones, and they're okay with a long path to get to success when they're five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, they love the accordion. I can't tell you how many like elementary schools I play, and there'll be five kids that come up and be like. I need to touch it. I need to play it. I want to do this is what I want to do. Like they, they don't care about the aspect that's like, oh, it's going to take a long time for you to learn how to play this well and not sound terrible. Um, where the piano or guitar, you can sound pretty good in one day if you do enough practice. The accordion takes years, like the violin or the trumpet takes years to sound good on, mm. uh, remotely good on. But the young kids always gravitate towards it because it moves and it does so many things. So it is there. To get the accordion. And the thing is, remember, in America, it was the most popular instrument when you look at the late 40s and early 50s. So, and that's not that far removed from where we are. So, I think an accordion revolution could happen. And look at so many other countries. Most countries around the world, you cannot play a wedding gig and play the genre of that country without an accordion. Not only, you know, that it's popular in, say, Brazil, you can't have a Brazilian band without an accordion. The hmm. same with Argentina, the same with Colombia, the same with Mexico, the same with the Dominican Republic, the same with France, with Sweden, with Finland, with Norway, with Germany, with Austria, with Italy, uh, with Russia, with Ukraine, with so many countries around the world, with Portugal, with Spain. If you're going to have a band of that country, you have to have the accordion. It re in Ireland, in Scotland, they go keep going. It's only America and Canada that that you just you know accordion. Well, we don't need accordion. That's that's what you know the immigrants did. <laughs> it's like so. Um, America, Canada, and Hungary, of course. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I mean, accordion is big in Hungary, just not polka. I right? Know no. like, yeah, let's do polka. Uh, no. mm. Slovenia, yes, Czechoslovakia, maybe, yeah, but uh, not, not uh, Hungary. <laughs> well, Corey, we applaud your path to making accordion music cool because that's how Dave and I feel. That's how uh, our listeners feel. We think it's cool. We think it should be more recognized and we love, you know, everything that you're doing and, and I can't wait to keep following your career and, and see what else comes next. Well, you're going to be confused because there's going to be a lot of chasing snowstorms, uh, racing cars <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, doing stock market things. I have too many hobbies, you know, so <laughs> you'll see accordion in there once in a while. But, <laughs> but no, that, thank you. Thank you. I, 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 especially to all the new fans. Yes. Hope, uh, if you love accordion and I'm always, that's my whole life's goal. I mean, I'm too deep in the rabbit hole now. That's all I do is try to make accordion cool. And thank you so, so much for having me as a guest. My goodness, thank you so much. Well, thanks so much to Corey Pesitero. And as Corey teased in the interview, he had something really special planned for the Indianapolis 500. Well, since we recorded that interview with Corey, the race has happened and the results are in. That's right, CPEZ teamed up with Mario Andretti and they broke the land speed record at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway for the fastest land speed a musician has ever given a performance at. How pretty stinking majestic! Well, I guess that literally makes Corey the fastest accordion player in the world. From all of us here at Dave Nathan's 2000 Inch Weird Al podcast, congratulations to you, CPEZ. And be sure to check him out over at cpezmusic.com. This episode is brought to you in part by Discover Darwin, promoting tourism in Darwin, Minnesota. Not only is historic Darwin, Minnesota a uh, beautiful, it's also ballin'. Today, July 13th, 2022, is the 10th annual Darwin Night at the Ballpark. That's right. Head on over to Saints Field in nearby Dassel to watch the North Star League rivals, the Litchfield Blues, take on the dassel dash Coqueto Saints. For those planning to attend, the game starts at 7. However, the festivities start at 6 p.m. with barbecue and old-time music. And you'll definitely want to be there early so you can cheer on the Darwin ballplayers who will be introduced starting at 6.40 p.m. And as per tradition, the evening will also include twine ball races, prize drawings, and photos with Rudy, the Darwin mascot. And Darwin hats will be given to 100 lucky drawing winners. Ooh, I want one! And if that's not enough to convince you, free tickets are available at most Darwin businesses. So visit Darwin, Minnesota on your next home run. 
Discover Darwin more than just a twine ball. And after you visit Darwin, Minnesota, be sure to visit discoverdarwin.biz. Oh, wow. It sounds like we've got a message on the 347 Spatula Hotline, the official hotline of Dave and Ethan's 2000-inch Weird Al podcast. All right, intern Frank, make yourself useful and play that message. Hey, Dave and Ethan. It's your old pal Chris, the cartoon-loving geek from Canada. Well, as you may recall, in your last podcast episode, you guys asked a question about whether or not we Canadians celebrate Weasel Stomping Day. And if we do, do we celebrate it on the same day as you guys? Well, being a Canadian myself, allow me to shed some light on the subject. We have a holiday just like it, but not with weasels. You see, weasels are actually very scarce up here in Canada. So... We stomp Kodiak marmosets on June 31st instead. Now, in case you're wondering, the Kodiak marmoset is a vicious predatory creature native to the Canadian wilderness and is known for being the world's largest, smallest, primate. Now, for festive clothing, instead of Viking helmets, we wear authentic barbarian helmets instead. And rather than wearing boots, we wear steel-toed snowshoes. Also, instead of mayonnaise, We actually lure the creatures out of hiding by spreading a mixture of french fries, cheese curds, and gravy on our lawns. We call it poutine. And last but not least, when the stomping is done for the day, we gather together under a makeshift pagoda decorated with empty boxes of craft dinner and join hands with the various members of the Royal Canadian Kilted Yaksmen as we sing Celine Dion songs all night long while guzzling back kegs of the finest maple syrup imported from Saskatchewan. Oh, I'm telling you guys, it's an awesome holiday. You have to come up here sometime and give it a try. Well, I sure hope that clears up everything you guys wanted to know, both you and your listeners, of course. Now, if you'll excuse me, i got to get back to work putting in my new rabid Wolverine security system, so I'm going to have to let you go. Ciao for now, guys. Chris, thank you for your wonderful message and spilling all the beans about Kodiak Marmoset Stomping Day. I had no idea! Yeah, you Canadians sure have some wacky traditions. Well, hopefully the Royal Canadian Kilted Yaksmen aren't upset at you for sharing confidential Canadian secrets with us. Once again, Chris, you have certainly proven your title as Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast official cartoon love and geek from Canada. This is a special hamster alert to the Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast broadcast alert system sponsored by Jack Bateman. We wanted to take a moment to share an important tip when it comes to keeping and caring for hamsters. As most of us know, chocolate contains a chemical called theobromine. Is that the tip? No, no, no. The tip is that theobromine might be toxic to hamsters. So I'm guessing you shouldn't feed your hamster chocolate. Absolutely not. You should also avoid feeding your hamster caffeine or alcohol. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hard stop. Gotta pass. You're saying I can't share a cold brew or a brewski with our hamsters Ethan and Ethan? Yes, that is what I am saying. And no chocolate milk? No hot cocoa? Ethan, do it for the hamsters. Do it for Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast hamster sponsor, Jack Bateman. I believe in you. You can do it. That is all for this week's special hamster alert via the Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast broadcast alert system. Dave and Ethan's 2000-inch Weird Al podcast is brought to you absolutely free thanks to our incredible sponsors, Burrito Burrito, Discover Darwin, Jackson Scoggins, and Jack Bateman. Our podcast is also supported by everyone else in our Patreon family, with special thanks to our amazing close personal friend level Patreon supporters, Scott, Zeb, Adriana, Allison, Blair, Frank from the Bank, Matthew, Mike, Rim Jams, Jared, and Rocky, Javier, Nancy, NES Josh 64, Gus and Alicia, Jake, UH Jeff, Kenneth, and also thanks to our newest Patreon supporter, Andrew, and everyone else in our pretty stinking majestic Patreon family. If you enjoy our freaking fantastic Weird Al podcast, please consider supporting us at patreon.com slash 2000 inch. There are awesome benefits like getting your name on the podcast, your very own private RSS feed, which allows you access to all our bonus episodes and access to secret episodes. 
And now would be a really good time to join if you have not already, because you will be the very first to hear our unfortunate return of ridiculously self-indulging ill-advised vanity tour concert review bonus episodes the moment they are posted. And don't forget to check out our official merchandise over at shop.2000inch.com. Now, as you know, later this month, Dave and I will be traveling to Darwin, Minnesota, while we are out in Minnesota seeing Weird Al, and you better believe it, we've got our Discover Darwin shirts ready to go, so you gotta make sure you've got yours too, to wear them in solidarity. Over at shop.2000inch.com. Well, one thing both Ethan and I love is hearing from our listeners and other Weird Al fans. So please join our Facebook community and post about Weird Al by visiting group.2000inch.com. And be sure to head on over to our Discord server for even more riveting Weird Al-related conversations. You can find links to both of them on our website. Plus, we also absolutely love it when we receive voicemail via our official patent-pending 27-hour-a-day podcast hotline, 347 Spatula. That's right. It's a real phone number. Give it a call, 347 Spatula. And you might even hear your message in a future episode. For everything about our podcast, including incredible past episodes and guests, be sure to visit weirdalpodcast.com or 2000inch.com. And while you're there, click on Ridiculously Self-Indulgent Bonus Episodes to follow along with our adventures on tour. Or click on Black and White and Weird All Over Bonus Episodes for special bonus episode book series where John Bermuda Schwartz, the author of the book, walks us through page by page and picture by picture. You can keep up on new episodes, podcast news, and events by following at 2000inch on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And thank you for subscribing and leaving reviews on your favorite podcast app. Make sure you are subscribed because it not only helps the podcast, it helps our personal self-esteem. Please, please, please. Thank you once again to our guest, Corey Pesaturo, as well as Chad Kelson, a.k.a. Metal L, Jared Marker. Chris Sear, the cartoon-loving geek from Canada, and Rudy, the Darwin mascot. Thank you to the Grammy Award-winning Jim Kimo West for our incredible podcast theme song. And thank you to Weird Al Yankovic, as this podcast probably would not exist without him. And a big thank you to all of you, each and every one of our loyal listeners, subscribers, Patreon supporters and sponsors, and everyone else who makes our podcast possible. Thank you for choosing Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast. And until next time, remember to gill and chill. Be sure to join us next episode because we have a real treat for you. We are joined by the voice actor, comedy musician, and rapper behind the legendary song Fets Vet, the one and only MC Chris, who takes a break from his national tour to tell us all about his exciting career and his love of Weird Al. And that was Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast episode 164-inch. Wait, Metal Al's still here? How the bleep do you remember all that crap?